Chapter 46 I woke up feeling more slugged, more beaten steak, the heat does it in Greece, than usual. It was nearly ten o'clock. I soaked my head in cold water, dragged on my clothes, and went downstairs under the colonnade. I looked under the muslin on the table, my breakfast, the spirit stove to heat up the usual brass ricky of coffee. I waited a moment, but no one appeared. There was a deserted silence about the house that puzzled me. I had expected conscious more comedy, not an empty stage. I sat down and ate my breakfast. I carried the breakfast things round to Maria's cottage on the pretext of being helpful, but her door was locked. First failure. I went upstairs, knocked on Conscious's door, tried it. Second failure. Then I went round all the ground-floor rooms in the house. I even cursorily searched the bookcases in the music room for his psychiatric papers, but without success. I knew a sudden fear because of last night. It was all over. They were all vanished for good. I walked to the statue all round the domain, like a man searching for a lost key, then back to the house. Nearly an hour had passed. It remained as deserted as before. I began to feel desperate and at a loss. What should I do now? Go to the village? Tell the police? In the end, I went down to the private beach. The boat was gone. I swam out of the little cove and round its eastern headland. There, some of the tallest cliffs on the island, a hundred feet or more high, fell into the sea among a litter of boulders and broken rocks. The cliffs curved in a very flat, concave arc half a mile eastwards, not really making a bay, but finally jutting sufficiently from the coast to hide the beach where the three cottages were. I examined every yard of the cliffs, no way down, no place where even a small boat could land. Yet this was the area the two sisters supposedly headed for when they went home. There was only low scrub on the abrupt sloping cliff tops after the pines ended, manifestly impossible to hide in. That left only one solution. They made their way along the top of the cliffs, then circled inland and down past the cottages. I swam a little further out to sea, but then a colder vein of water made me turn back. I saw at once. A girl in a pale pink summer dress was standing under the edge of the pines on top of the cliff, some hundred yards to the east of where I was, in shadow, but brilliantly, exuberantly conspicuous. She waved down, and I waved back. She walked a few yards along under the green wall of trees, the sunlight between the pines dappling the pale rose of the dress, and then with a leap of surprise I saw another flash of pink, a second girl. They stood, each replica of each, and the closer waved again, beckoning me ashore. They both turned and disappeared, as if they were setting off to meet me halfway. Five or six minutes later, I arrived, very out of breath, with a shirt pulled over my wet trunks, at the far side of the gully. They weren't by the statue, and I had a few moments' angry suspicion that I was being teased again, shown them only to lose them. But I went down toward the cliffs, past the carob, the sea seared blue through the furthermost pines. Suddenly, I saw their two figures— they were sitting on a shaded hummock of earth and rock to the east. I walked more slowly, sure of them now. The identical dresses were very simple, with short, faintly puffed sleeves, scalloped deep above the breast. They wore powder blue stockings, pale gray shoes. They looked very feminine, pretty, a pair of nineteen-year-olds in their summer Sunday best, yet to my mind vaguely overdressed, towny, even weirdly, there was a rush basket beside June, as if they were still students at Cambridge. June stood as I got near and came to meet me. She had her hair down, like her sister, golden skin and even deeper tan than I had realized the previous night. And there was a facial difference at close range, a greater openness, even a touch of impudent tomboyishness. 
Behind her, Julie watched us meet. She was noticeably unsmiling and holding herself aloof. June grinned. I told her you said you didn't care which of us you met this morning. That was kind of you. She took my hand and led me to the foot of the hummock. Here's your knight in shining armor. Julie looked coolly down at me. Hello, her sister said. She knows all. Julie slid a look at her. I also know whose fault it was. But then she stood and came down beside us. The reproof in her eyes gave way to concern. Did you get back all right? I told them what had happened. The spitting. The first moments of sisterly banter rapidly disappeared. I had the benefit of two pairs of disturbed blue-gray eyes. Then they looked at each other, as if this confirmed something they had been discussing. Julie spoke first. Have you seen Maurice this morning? Not a sign. There was another exchanged glance. June said, nor have we. The whole place seems deserted. I've been looking everywhere for you. June glanced behind me into the trees. It may seem, but I bet it isn't. Who is that damned black man? Maurice calls him his valet. When you're not here, he even serves at table. He's supposed to look after us when we're hiding. Actually, he gives us both the creeps. Is he really a mute? You may well ask. We suspect not. He just sits and stares as if he could say worlds. He's never... Julie shook her head. He hardly even seems aware we're female. He must be blind as well. June made a little grimace. It would be insulting if it wasn't such a relief. The old man must know what happened last night. That's what we're trying to work out. June added, The mystery of the dog that didn't bark in the night. I looked at her. I thought you and I weren't supposed to meet officially. We were always going to today. I was supposed to back Maurice's story. Julie added, after I'd put on another of my celebrated madwoman acts. But he must. That's what puzzles us. The trouble is he hasn't told us the next chapter, what we're supposed to be when you've seen through the schizophrenia, June said. So we've decided to be ourselves and see what happens. You must tell me all you know now. Julie gave her sister a dry look. June gave a little start of much surprise. I'm not de trop by any chance. You can go and improve your nauseating tan. We'll perhaps tolerate you at lunch. June made a little curtsy, then went and picked up the basket. But as she came back, she raised a warning finger. I shall want to hear all that concerns me. I smiled, then belatedly realized as June walked away that I was getting a cool and wide-eyed look from Julie. It was so dark, the same clothes. I'm very angry with her. Things are quite complicated enough without that. She's very different from you. We've rather cultivated that. But then her voice was gentler, more honest. We're very close, really. I took her hand. I prefer you. But she wouldn't let me pull her close, though the hand was not withdrawn. I found a place along the cliff where at least we can talk without being seen. We went through the trees to the east. You're not seriously angry. Did you enjoy kissing her? Only because I thought it was you. How long did it last? A few seconds. She jerked on my hand. Liar. But there was a hidden smile on her face. She led the way round an outcrop of rock a solitary pine, then the steep slope down to the cliff edge. The outcrop formed a natural wall, shielding us from eyes inland behind us. Another basket stood on a dark green rug, spread in the thin shade of the wind-bent tree. I glanced round, then took Julie in my arms. This time she let me kiss her, but only briefly before she turned her head away. I so wanted to come last night. It was awful. I had to let her meet you. 
there was a little out-breath. She complains I have all the excitement, apart from anything else. It doesn't matter. Now we've got all day. She kissed my shoulder through my damp shirt. We must talk. She slipped out of her flat-heeled shoes, then sat down on the rug with her legs curled behind then sat down on the rug with her legs curled beside her. The pale blue stockings ended just below her bare knees. The dress was really white, but thick sewn with a close pattern of tiny roses. It was cut deep round the neck, to where the breasts began to swell apart. The clothes gave her a kind of sensual innocence, a schoolgirlishness. The sun wind teased the ends of her hair against her back as when she had been Lily on the beach. But all that side of her had drained away, like water between stones. I sat beside her, and she turned away and reached for the basket. The fabric tightened over the breasts, the small waist. She faced back, and our eyes met. Those fine, gray, hyacinth eyes, tilted corners, lingering a little in mine. Go on. Ask me anything. What did you read at Cambridge? Classics? She saw my surprise. My father's subject. He was like you, a schoolmaster. Was? He died in the war, in India. And June as well? She smiled. I was the sacrificial lamb. She was allowed to do what she liked. Modern languages. When did you come down? Last year. She opened her mouth, then changed her mind and set the basket between us. I brought all I could. I'm so scared they'll see what I'm doing. I looked round, but the natural wall protected us completely. Only someone on top of it could have observed us. She produced a book. It was small, half-bound in black leather, with green marbled paper sides, rubbed and worn. I looked at the title page. Quintus Horatius Flaccus Parisis. It's Dido Ene. Who's he? I saw the date, 1800. A famous French painter. She turned me back to the flyleaf. On it, in very neat writing, was an inscription. From the idiots of IVB to their lovely teacher, Miss Julia Holmes. Underneath were fifteen or so signatures, Penny O'Brien, Susan Smith, Susan Mowbray, Jane Willings, Leah Gluckstein, Jean Ann Moffat. Where was this? Please look at these first. Six or seven envelopes. Three were addressed to Miss Julia and Miss June Holmes, care of Maurice Conchis, Esquire, Burani, Fraxos, Greece. They had English stamps and recent postmarks. All from Dorset. Read one. I took out a letter from the top envelope. It was on headed paper. Osti Cottage, Cern Abbas, Dorset. It began in a rapid scrawl. Darlings, I've been frantically busy with all the doodah for the show. On top of that, Mr. Arnold's been in, and he wants to do the painting as soon as possible. Also, guess who? Roger rang up. He's at Bovington now and asked himself over for the weekend. He was so disappointed you were both abroad, hadn't heard. I think he's much nicer, not nearly so pompous, and a captain. I didn't know what on earth to do with him, so I asked the Drayton girl and her brother round for supper, and I think it went off rather well. Billy is getting so fat, old Tom says it's all the grass— so I asked the D girl if she'd like to give him a ride or two. I knew you wouldn't mind. I turned to the end. The letter was signed, Mummy. I looked, and she pulled a face. Sorry. She handed me three other letters. One was evidently from a former fellow teacher, news about people, school activities, another from a friend who signed herself, Claire, one from a bank in London to June, advising her that a remittance of 100 pounds had been received on May 31st. I memorized the address, Barclays Bank, England's Lane, London, NW3. The manager's name was P.J. Fairn. 
And this, it was her passport, Miss J.N. Holmes, N. Nielsen, my mother's family name. I read the signalment opposite her photograph. Profession, teacher. Date of birth, 1601-1929. Place of birth, Winchester. Is Winchester where your father taught? He was the senior classics master there. Country of residence, England. Height, 5 feet 8 inches. Color of eyes, gray. Hair, fair. Special peculiarities. Scar on left wrist. Twin sister. At the bottom she had signed her name. A neat italic hand. I flicked through the visa pages. Two journeys to France, one to Italy the summer before, an entry visa to Greece made out in April, an entry stamp May 2nd, Athens. There was none for the year before. I thought back to May 2nd. That all this had been preparing, even then? Which college were you at? Girton? You must know old Miss Wainwright. Dr. Wainwright? At Girton? Chaucer expert, Langland. She stared at me, then looked down, then up again with a little smile. She wasn't falling for that. Sorry. Okay. You were at Girton. Then a teacher? She mentioned the name of a famous girl's grammar school in North London. That's not very plausible. Why not? Not enough cachet. I didn't want cachet. I wanted to be in London. She picked at her skirt. You mustn't think I was born to this sort of life. Why did you want to be in London? June and I did act quite a lot at Cambridge. We both had careers, but what was hers? She was in advertising, copywriting. Not a world I liked very much, or its men, anyway. I interrupted. I'm just saying that neither of us was mad about what we were doing. We got involved with a London amateur company called the Tavistock Rip. They have a little theater in Canonbury. I've heard of it. I leaned back on an elbow. She sat propped on an arm. Beyond her, the deep blue sea merged into the sky's azure. A breeze blew through the pine branches above us, caressed the skin like a current of warm water. I found her new, her real self a simplicity and seriousness in her expression, even more delectable than the previous ones. I realized that it was what had been lacking, a sense of her ordinariness, that she was attainable. Last November they put on Liz Estrada. Tell me first why you weren't happy teaching. Are you? No. Or not until I met you. Just not feeling my heart was in it. The rather prim facade one has to wear. I smiled and nodded. Liz Estrada. I thought you might have read about it. No. Anyway, a rather clever producer there called Tony Hill put us both, June and I, in the main part. I stood in front of the stage and spoke the lines, some in Greek, and June did all the acting in mime. It was in some of the papers. Quite a lot of real theater people came to see it. The production, not us. She reached in her basket and found a packet of cigarettes. I lit them both, and she went straight on. One day near the end of the run, a man came backstage and told us he was a theatrical agent, and he had someone who wanted to meet us, a film producer. She smiled at my raised eyebrows. Of course. And he was so secretive about it, and he was so secretive about who it was that it seemed to co- and he was so secretive about who it was that it seemed too clumsy and obvious for words but then two days later we both got enormous bouquets and an invitation to have lunch at Claridge's from someone who signed himself don't bother i can guess she bowed her head dryly We talked it over then, really just for fun, went along. She paused. I suppose he dazzled us. We were so sure it was going to be some dreadful pseudo-Hollywood type. Instead, there was this... He seemed perfectly open, obviously very rich, 
He told us he had business interests all over Europe. He gave us a card, some Swiss address, but he said he lived mainly in France and Greece. He even described Barani and the island, everything here, exactly as it is, as a place. Nothing about his past? We did ask about his English. He said he'd wanted to be a doctor as a young man and had studied medicine in the Lon and had studied medicine in London. She shrugged. I know countless things he told us then were so much eyewash, but putting together all the bits of jigsaw we've been handed since, I think he must have spent a lot of his youth in England. Perhaps he even went to boarding school at home. He was very sarcastic about the English public school system the other day. It did rather sound from the heart. She put out her cigarette. I'm sure that at some time in his life he rebelled against money and his father. You've not discovered? That very first time, we did politely ask. I remember exactly what he said. My father was the dullest of human beings, a millionaire with the mind of a shopkeeper. End of subject. We've never really got any closer than that except that he did once say he was born in Alexandria, Maurice himself. There is a rich Greek colony there. So, something really the opposite of the De Ducan story? I suspect that may have been a temptation Maurice himself underwent at some point, a way he might have used the fortune he inherited. That's how I read it, but you didn't finish at Claridge's. It did all rather bear this out. He was so anxious to put himself across as a cosmopolitan man of culture, not a mere millionaire. He asked us what we read at Cambridge, which of course allowed him to demonstrate his own reading. Then the contemporary theater, he obviously knows that very well. What's going on in the rest of Europe? He said he was backing a small experimental theater in Paris. She took a breath. Anyway cultural credentials thoroughly established. More than thoroughly. We were beginning to wonder why we were there. In the end, June, in her usual way, asked point blank, whereupon he announced that he was the major shareholder in a film company in the Lebanon. Her gray eyes opened wide at me. Then, in the next breath, absolutely out of the blue, she paused. He wanted us to star in a film this summer. But you must have. Actually, we nearly had the giggles. We knew he must really be suggesting something else, what we'd suspected in the first place. But then he said the terms. She showed me a still amazed face. A thousand pounds each when we signed a contract. A thousand more when we finished the making. Plus a hundred pounds a month each for expenses of which, it's turned out, we have virtually none. Christ, have you seen any of it? The contract money and the expenses, that letter, she looked down as if I must think her mercenary and smoothed the nap of the rug. It's one major reason we've stuck it here, Nicholas. It's so absurd. We've done so little to earn it. What was the film supposed to be about? It was to be shot here in Greece. I'll explain in a minute. She gave me an uncertain look. You mustn't think we were totally innocent. We didn't at all say yes at once, rather the opposite. And he played his cards so well, he was almost paternal. Of course we couldn't decide at once. We'd want to make inquiries, commit... We'd want to make inquiries, consult our agent... Not that we actually even had one at that point. Go on. We were driven home, in a hired rolls, to think it over, to a pokey top-floor flat in Belsize Park, like two Cinderella's. He was so clever, he never put any suspicious kind of pressure on us. We saw him, oh, twice, three times more. He took us out, theater, opera, Never any attempt to get either of us on our own. I'm missing out so many things, but you know what he can be like when he wants to charm you, that feeling he can give you of knowing what life's about. What did everyone else think? Your friends, this producer man. 
They thought we ought to be very careful. We found ourselves an agent. He hadn't heard of Maurice or the film company in Beirut. But he soon tracked it down. It makes bread and butter pictures for the Arab market, Iraq and Egypt. As Maurice had already told us, he'd explained that they as Maurice had already told us. He'd explained that they wanted to get into the European market. Our film was only to be financed by the Lebanese company for some tax reason. What was it called? Polymus Films. She spelt it. It's in whatever they list film companies in, the trade directory. Perfectly respectable and rather successful, so far as our agent could tell, like the contract when we got to that. Also absolutely normal. Could he have fixed the agent? She let out her breath. We've wondered, but I don't think he had to. I suppose it was the money. There it was, in the bank. Money must be true. I mean, we realized it was a kind of risk. Perhaps if it had just been the one of us, but being two. She gave me a wry little interrogative glance under her eyebrows. Are you believing any of this? Shouldn't I be? I feel like I'm not explaining it very well. You're doing fine. But she gave me another look, still doubtful about how I was reacting to such apparent gullibility, then lowered her eyes. There's something else. Greece. Having done classics, I've always had this longing to come here. That was part of the inducement. Maurice kept promising we'd have time to see everything, which he hasn't welched on. I mean, there's this, but the rest of it has been like one long holiday. Again, she seemed almost embarrassed at the knowledge that their rewards had been much greater than mine. He's got a fabulous yacht. We live like princesses on it. Your mother? Oh, Maurice saw to that. He insisted on meeting her one day when she'd come up to see us in London. Bowled her over with his gentlemanliness, she grinned ruefully, and his money. She knows what's happened? We've told her we're still rehearsing. We don't want to worry her. She pulled a face. She's an expert at the useless tizzy. This film? It was taken from a demotic Greek story by a writer called Theodoritis. Have you heard of him? Three Hearts? I shook my head. Apparently, it's never been translated. It was written in the early 20s. It's about two English girls. They're supposed to be the British ambassador at Athens' daughters, though not twins in the original, who go for a holiday on a Greek island during the First World War. And one doesn't happen to be called Lily Montgomery by any chance. No, but wait. This island. They meet a Greek writer there, a poet. He's got tuberculosis, dying. And he falls in love with each sister in turn, and they fall in love with him, and everyone's terribly miserable, and it all ends, you can guess. Actually, it's not quite as silly as that. It does have a certain period charm. You've read it? What I can. It's quite short. I spoke in Greek. Zerete kala tanea elenica. She answered in a much more fluent and better accented demotic than my own, that she was hearing some modern Greek, though knowing the ancient language was less help than people imagined, and gave me a steady look. I touched my forehead in obeisance. He also showed us a script in London. In English? He said he was hoping to distribute two versions, Greek and English, dubbing voices both ways. She gave a little shrug. It seemed playable, though it was really just a cunning rehearsal. But how? Wait a minute. More evidence. She delved in the bag, then swiveled round so that we were sitting facing in opposite directions. She came out with a wallet, produced two cuttings from it. One showed the two sisters, standing in a London street, in overcoats and woolen hats, laughing. I knew the paper by the print, but it was, in any case, gummed on to a grey cuttings agency tag. Evening Standard, January 8, 1953. The paragraph underneath ran, and brains as well. 
two lucky twins, June and Julie, on right, Holmes, who will star in the film this summer to be shot in Greece. The twins, both have Cambridge degrees, acted a lot at varsity, speak eight languages between them. Unfair note for bachelors, neither wants to marry yet. We didn't write the caption, so I deduced. The other cutting was from the cinema trade news. It repeated, in Americanese, what she had just told me. Oh, and while I'm at it, my mother. She showed me a snapshot from the wallet. A woman with fluffy hair in a deck chair in a garden, a clumber spaniel beside her. I could see another photograph, and made her show me that as well. A man in a sports shirt, a nervous and intelligent face. He seemed in his early thirties. This is... Yes, she added, was. She took the photo back. There was something closed in her face, and I did not press. She went quickly on. Of course we realize now it was a perfect cover for Maurice if we were to play well-brought-up young ambassador's daughters in 1914, we innocently trotted off for lessons in deportment, had clothes fittings, all the lily costumes were made in London. Then in May we came out. He met us in Athens, had said the rest of the company wouldn't assemble for a fortnight. He had warned us, so we weren't surprised. He took us on a cruise with him to Rhodes and Crete on the Arethusa, his yacht, which he never brings here. It's usually at Nauplia. In Athens, you stayed in his house? I don't think he's got one there. He says he hasn't. We stayed at the Grand Bretagne. No office? I know, she contracted her mouth self-accusingly. But we'd been told only the location shooting would take place here and the interiors in Beirut. She showed us set designs. She hesitated. It was a new world for us, Nicholas, if we hadn't been so green and so excited, and he did introduce us to two people. The Greek actor, he said, was going to play the poet, and the director, another Greek. We all had dinner. Actually, we rather liked them both. There was lots of talk about the film. You didn't check on them? We were only there a couple of nights, then often they got with Maurice. They were to come straight here, but never did. We've never seen them again. She picked a loose thread from the hem of her skirt. As a matter of fact, we did think it was odd there was no publicity, but they even had a reason for that. Apparently here, if you say you're going to make a film, you get hundreds of extras turning up in hope of a job. By chance, I knew that was true. Some three months before, a Greek film unit had been working on Hydra. Two of the school waiters had run away in the hope of being hired by them. It had been a minor scandal for a couple of days. I didn't tell Julie, but smiled with the secret knowledge. You came here, after a lovely cruise, but that's when the madness began, hardly forty-eight hours. Already we'd both realized there was something subtly different about Maurice. Because of the cruise, in so many ways, we felt closer to him. I suppose we both missed not having a father since 1943. He couldn't be that, but it was a little like finding a kind of fairy uncle, being alone with him so much, knowing we could trust him, and we had fascinating evenings, enormous arguments about life, love, literature, the theater, everything, except when we tried to discover his past. Then a sort of curtain came down. You know how it is. Things you really only see in retrospect. How shall I put it? It was all so civilized on the boat. Then suddenly here it was as if he owned us. We somehow weren't his guests any more. Again she sought my eyes, as if I must be blaming her, for liking anything about the old man. She had lain back on an elbow, and her voice had dropped. Now and then she would touch her hair back from where the breeze carried it across her cheek. I know the feeling. The first thing was, we wanted to go and see the village, but he said no, he wanted to make the film as quietly as possible. But it was too quiet. 
No one else here. No sign of generators, lights, cleags, all the things they'd need. No production unit. And this feeling that Maurice was watching us. There was something in the way he began to smile, as if he knew something we didn't, and didn't have to hide it anymore. I know that exactly. It was our second afternoon here. June, I was sleeping, tried to go for a walk. She got to the gate, and suddenly this silent Negro, we'd never seen him before, stepped out in the path and stopped her. He wouldn't let her pass, wouldn't answer her. Of course, she was petrified. She came back at once, and we marched off to Maurice. Her eyes lingered a dry moment on mine. Then he told us. She looked down at the rug. Not quite straight out. He could see we were, obviously. He put us through a sort of catechism. Had he ever behaved improperly, had he not honored all that the contract stipulated in financial terms, didn't the relationship we'd established on the cruise, you know, then he did come out with it. Yes, he had misled us about the film, but not totally. He did need the services of two accomplished and highly intelligent, his adjectives, young actresses. We must please listen. He swore blind that if, having listened, we were unconvinced, then you could go. She nodded. So we made the mistake of listening. It went on for hours in the end. The gist of it was that though he was truly interested in the theater, really does own this film studio in the Lebanon, he had remained much more the doctor than he'd led us to believe, that his field had been psychiatry. He'd even said that he'd studied under Jung. I've had that. I know so little about Jung. Did you think? I was convinced at the time. So were we in the end, and rather against our will. But that day he kept talking about our helping him cross a frontier to a new world that was half art and half science, a unique psychological and philosophical adventure, what might be an extraordinary voyage into the human unconscious. Those were all phrases he used. Of course, we wanted to know what lay behind all the fine words, what we were actually expected to do. Then, for the first time, he mentioned you, that he wanted to mount a situation in which we two were to play parts rather like the ones in the original, Three Hearts story, and you, without realizing it, would play the Greek poet. But, Christ Almighty, you must have... She tilted her head, looked away a moment, beyond the words to express it. Nicholas, we were flabbergasted, and yet, in some way... I don't know, it had somehow always been there. You know, real theater people are generally rather silly and superficial off stage. And Maurice, I remember June said something about feeling insulted. How dare he think he could buy people just because he was so rich? It was the nearest I'd ever seen him to being caught on the raw, hurt. He made a long speech, and I know for once it was sincere about the guilt he'd always felt over his money, how his only real passion was to know, to extend human knowledge, how his one dream was to realize a long-held theory, how it was not a selfishness, a mere strange whim, as far as genuineness in that way was concerned. He really was rather impressive. He even silenced June in the end. You must have asked what the theory was, over and over again, but he came up with the same old thing. If we knew we would contaminate the purity of the experiment, his words again, he did give us more analogies than we've ever had since. In one way it was to be a sort of fantastic extension of the Stanislavski method, improvising realities more real than reality. You were to be like a man following a mysterious voice, several voices, through a forest, of alternative possibilities, who wouldn't even know themselves, since they were us, what their alternatives really meant. Another parallel was a play, but without a writer or an audience, only actors. And in the end, can we be told then? He's promised that from the beginning. Me as well? He must be dying to know what you're really feeling and thinking. 
since you're the center of it all, the chief guinea pig, obviously he won you over that day. We spent a night talking it over alone. One minute we would, the next we wouldn't. In the end, June decided to make a little test. We came down the next morning and said we wanted to go home as soon as possible. He argued and argued, but we were adamant. In the end, he said very well, he'd have the yacht come from Nauplia and take us to Athens. But we said no. This day, now, we'd catch the steamer back to Athens, and he'd let you go. We packed. He took us and our luggage around the island in the boat. He was absolutely silent. He didn't say a word. All I could think about was losing the sunlight, everything around us. Dreary old London. It came to the point when we were only a hundred yards from the steamer. I looked at June and bit the apple. She nodded. Had he wanted the money back? No, that was another thing. And he was so delighted he didn't blame us at all, she sighed. He said it proved his choice was right. Through all this I had waited for a reference to the past, to my own certain knowledge that Conscience had now devoted at least three summers to his long-held theory, whatever it really was. But I held my tongue. Perhaps Julie sensed that I remained skeptical. That story last night about Saitavar, I think that's some kind of clue. The place of mystery in life, not taking anything for granted. A world where nothing is certain. That's what he's trying to create here. With himself cast as God. But not out of vanity, out of intellectual curiosity, as a hypothesis to see how we react, and not one kind of God, several. He keeps telling me hazard rules everything, but you can't knowingly pretend to be God as hazard. I think he means us to realize that, she added. He even jokes about it sometimes. We see far less of him ever since you appeared, much more only to do with whatever's happening. It's as if he's withdrawn, he says it. We can't expect to question God. I surveyed her bent head, the line of her body, her closeness, and almost heard Conscious's voice answering my doubt of hazard. Then why are you here with this girl, or does it matter as long as you are here with her? June says he questions you about me. Her eyes went skywards a moment. You've no idea. It's not only you. What I feel, whether I believe you, even what I think's going on in his... Maurice's mind. You can't imagine. It must have been obvious I was no actor. It wasn't at all. I thought you were brilliant, acting as if you couldn't act. She turned and lay on her stomach, head toward me. We've long realized that the first line he gave us, that we should mystify you, was a blind. According to the script, we deceive you, but the deceiving deceives us even more. This script? Script is a joke. He tells us roughly when to appear and disappear in terms of exits and entries, the sort of atmosphere to create, sometimes lines. That theological talk last night? Yes, he asked me to say that. She gave a little half-apologetic glance up. And I do believe it a little, anyway. But otherwise, you improvise? All along, he says that if things don't go quite as planned, it doesn't matter, as long as we keep to the main development. She said, it's also all about role-playing, how people believe in situations they don't understand. I told you, he has said that's part of it. One thing's obvious. He wants us to think he's putting all sorts of obstacles between us, then gives us all these opportunities to destroy them. To begin with, there was no talk of getting you to fall in love with me except in a very distant 1915-y sort of way. Then by that second week, he persuaded me that I had to make some compromise between my 1915 false self and your 1953 true one. He asked me what I'd do if you wanted to kiss me, she shrugged. 
once kissed men on stage, in the end I said, if it was absolutely necessary, that second Sunday I hadn't decided. That's why I put on that dreadful act. It was a nice act. That first conversation with you, I had terrible track, far worse than I've ever had on a real stage. But you forced yourself to let me kiss you. Only because I thought I had to, I followed the hollow of her arched back. She had raised one blue stocking foot backwards in the air, and chin cupped in her hands was avoiding my eyes. She said, I think for him it's like some mathematical proposition, except that we're all X, and he can put us where he likes in his equation. There was a little silence. I'm not being honest. I wanted to know what it was like being kissed by you. Despite the adverse propaganda, that didn't begin till after that Sunday afternoon, though he had said all along that I mustn't get emotionally involved with you. She stared at the rug. A yellow butterfly hovered over us, then glided away. Did he give a reason? Yes, that one day I might have to make you dislike me. She stared down because you'd have to start feeling attracted to June. It all goes back to the ridiculous three hearts thing again. The poet character did transfer his affections. One sister was fickle, the other caught him on the rebound, you know. She added, he does keep running you down terribly to both of us, as if he's apologizing to the hounds. As if he's apologizing to the hounds for having provided such an awful fox, which is palpably absurd, especially when you've done all the hunting. She looked up. Do you remember that speech he gave me when I was lily about your having no poetry, no humor, and all the rest? I'm sure it was meant just as much for me as for you. But why should he drive us together? She said nothing for a moment. I don't think the Three Hearts story means anything, but there's a much greater work of literature that may. She left a pause for me to guess, then murmured, Yesterday afternoon, after my little scene, another magician once sent a young man hewing wood. I missed that, Prospero and Ferdinand, those lines I recited. He also brought it up on my very first visit here, before I even knew you existed. I noticed she was avoiding my eyes. It was not, given the end of the tempest, difficult to guess why. I murmured, He can't have known we... I know. It's just, she shook her head, that I'm his to give. She added, Not you. I know. It's just, she shook her head, that I'm his to give. She added, Not you. And he certainly has a Caliban, she sighed, I know, which reminds me, this hiding place of yours. Nicholas, I can't show you. If we are being watched, they'll see. It's close to here? It's close to here? Yes. At least you can tell me where. She seemed embarrassed in a different way, again avoided my eyes. Supposing you were in trouble, she smiled. If we were earmarked for a fate worse than death, I think it would have happened by now. But why can't I know? You promised. I still promise, but please not now. She must have heard the sharpness in my voice, because she reached out and touched my hand. I'm sorry. I've broken so many other promises to Maurice this last hour. I feel I ought to keep one. Is it so important? Not at all. "'except he says he wants to surprise you with it one day. "'I don't know how. "'I was puzzled, yet in a way it was additional proof of her story, "'a contrariness that confirmed it. "'I left a little silence as a test, "'knowing that liars hate silence. "'But she passed that. "'Have you talked with the other people here? "'We've never seen the others to talk to. "'There's Maria, but she's hopeless.' as impossible to get anything out of as Joe, the crew on the yacht. They're just Greeks. I don't think they know what goes on here. She suddenly said, Did June tell you we suspect there's a spy at your school? Who? Maurice told us one day you were very standoffish with the other masters, 
that they didn't like you. I thought at once of Demetriades, of how, when I reflected, it was odd that such a natural gossip should have kept my trips to Barani so secret. Besides, I was standoffish. He was the only other master I was ever frequently with, outside the common room. I remembered with a flash of relief that I had lied to him about meeting Allison, not out of cunning, but to avoid his wretched jokes. I can guess who it would be. It's the one side of Maurice I can't stand. All the spying. He's got a cine camera on the yacht, with a telephoto lens he claims it's for birds. If I ever caught the old bastard, I've never seen it here. I think it's just another of his fifty-seven varieties of red herring. I watched her. I knew there was some conflict in her, some indecision, some admission she wanted to coax out of me, that ran contrary to most of what we had been saying. I remembered what her sister had told me about her the night before, and made a guess. In spite of everything, you want to go on? She shook her head. Nicholas, I don't know. Today, now, yes, tomorrow, probably not. Nothing like this ever happened to me before. I suppose if I have a clear instinct, it's that if we walked out on it, Nothing like it would ever happen again. Do you feel that? I had her eyes, and the moment seemed right. I sprang my final rest. Not really, since I know it's happened at least twice before this year. She was so surprised that she did not understand. She stared at my faint smile, then pushed off her stomach and sat back on her heels. You mean, you've been... Th this isn't your first... She was transparently set back. Her eyes, both hurt and lost, accused mine. My two predecessors at the school. But she still didn't understand. They told you? You knew all along? Just that something odd happened here last year, and the one before. I explained how I had found out, and how little, and that the old man had admitted it. Again, I watched to see how she would react. He also told me you'd both been here before, and met them. She stared at me, outraged. But we've never set foot, I know. She sat sideways and looked out to see. Oh, he's impossible. Then her eyes were back on mine. So all the time you've been thinking we... Not really. I knew he was lying about one thing. I described Mitford and the old man's tale of his supposed attraction for her. She asked questions. She wanted to know every detail. And you've really no idea what happened with them? They certainly never told anyone at the school. Mitford gave me that one hint. I have written to him. No answer yet. She searched my eyes one last time, then looked down. I suppose it argues that it can't be too awful in the end. That's what I try to tell myself. How extraordinary. You'd better not tell him. No, of course not. After a moment, she smiled wryly up. Do you think he has an endless supply of twin sisters? Like you? No. Not even him. She looked down from my unambiguous eyes. What do you think we should do? When's he due back? Or pretending to be back? This evening, or so we were told yesterday. It could be an interesting meeting. I may get the sack for incompetence, I said softly. I'll find you a job. There was a little silence, then she met my look. I reached a hand, and it too was met. I pulled her toward me, and we lay side by side, a little apart. I began to trace the lines of her face, the eyes which she closed, the nose to its tip, then the contour of the mouth. She kissed the finger. I drew her closer and kissed the mouth. She responded, yet I sensed the reserve still, a wanting and not wanting. We separated a little. I stared at that face. It seemed to me one I could never tire of, an eternal source of desire, of the will to protect, without either physical or psychological flaw. She opened her eyes and gave me a gentle, but reticent smile. What are you thinking? How beautiful you are. 
Did you really not meet your friend in Athens? Would you be jealous if I had? Yes. Then I didn't. I bet you did, really. Honestly, she couldn't make it. Then you did want to meet her? Out of some sort of kindness to dumb animals, only to tell her it was no good, I'd given my soul to a witch. Some witch. I raised her hand and kissed it, then the scar. How did you get that? She cocked the wrist and looked at it. When I was ten, playing hide-and-seek, she made a fleeting duck's mouth, mocking herself. I should have learnt my lesson. I hid in the garden shed and knocked this what looked like a long stick off a peg and put up my arm to shield myself. She mimed it. It was a scythe. You poor thing. I kissed the wrist again, then once more drew us close, but after a while left her mouth, kissed the eyes, the neck, the throat, along the curves of the dress above the breasts, then found the mouth again. We explored each other's eyes. There was something still uncertain in hers, yet something melted as well. Suddenly they closed, and her mouth reached toward mine, as if she could speak better with lips now than in words. But just as we were becoming drowned in each other, unaware of anything but our joined mouths and close-pressed bodies, we were stopped. It was the bell from the house, a monotonous, regular ringing, but insistent, like a tocsin. We sat up and looked guiltily round. We seemed alone. Julie lifted my hand to see my wristwatch. It's probably June. Lunch. I leaned and kissed her head. I'd rather stay here. She'll only come and look for us. She flicked me a would-be dry glance. Most men find her more attractive than me. Then most men are idiots. The bell stopped. She kept my hand and looked at it as we sat side by side. Perhaps they just want something she finds it easier to give than I do. Any girl can give you that. She still examined my hand, as if it was some subject dissociated from me. Did you give it to this other man? I tried to. What went wrong? She shook her head as if it was too complicated, but then she said, I'm not a virgin, Nicholas. It's not that. But being hurt again? Being used again. How was he using you? The bell started afresh. She smiled up at me. It's a long story. Not now. She kissed me quickly, then stood and picked up her basket while I folded the rug and put it over my arm. We set off back for the house. We had hardly gone a few steps into the pines, when I caught a movement to the east in the corner of my eyes, a glimpse of a black shape drawing back behind intervening low branches some seventy or eighty yards away. I barely saw the man, but there was something unmistakable in the way he moved. We are being watched, that Joe character. We didn't stop, though she glanced past me. We can't do anything about it, except ignore him. But the presence of that hidden pair of eyes in the trees behind us could not really be ignored. From then on we walked rather self-consciously apart, almost guiltily. It was a guilt one part of me despised, since the better I knew the real girl beside me, the more artificial became the situation that kept us apart, and yet which another side of me, the eternal deception-relishing child, tolerated. There is something erotic in all collusion, Perhaps I should have known a more real guilt and remembered a more deeply hidden pair of eyes in the forest of my unconscious. Perhaps I did know then, for all my outward oblivion, and found an extra relish still. Long afterward, I realized why some men, racing drivers and their like, become addicted to speed. There are those of us who never see death ahead, but eternally behind. In any moment, that stops and thinks.